Okay, so welcome to the second part of dynamics in general relativity. So I start with two remarks about yesterday's lecture. First of all, thanks to all the students that came, or postdocs or PhD students that came to me after the talk and asked questions and helped me to understand that uh, a few things were not fully optimal how I explained them. Um, so in, for instance, this definition of a nonlinear stability that, that I tried to give here, um, I had to reshape it a bit. So I have lecture notes on what I'm doing here, but they are not yet online, so don't go there now. They will be on my webpage, hopefully Friday after the third talk, so tomorrow, where I've corrected that. Um, a second remark concerns um, maybe the impression that I gave yesterday that you would like to prove nonlinear stability for all kinds of solutions. That's, of course, not the aim, because there are certainly some solutions for Einstein equations that are instable. So there have been several recent results on full instability of certain um, models with negative cosmological constant, but there are actually quite simple models that you can construct as solutions to Einstein equations where you can easily see that they are instable, meaning in the neighborhood of the initial data manifold, you can always find uh, sort of initial data sets that have completely different late-time asymptotics. And an easy way to, to convince yourself that this should be sort of existing is, um, so let's say you start with asymptotically flat initial data close to Minkowski space, so that will evolve again back to Minkowski space by stability. So now you make the perturbation bigger and bigger, and at some point you have initial data such that the black hole forms. So that's a completely different space time. Yeah? So when you make this deformation in somewhat continuous way, it's sure, for sure on the, on the path to this other initial data set, there will be some point that correspond to an unstable solution, right? Because if you go a bit back, you will again go to Minkowski space. If you go a bit towards the black hole initial, the black hole formation initial data, then you will form a black hole, yeah? So you would like to prove stability only for those models where there's a good reason that they are actually stable. Okay, just to put this into context. So today's talk and maybe a first part of tomorrow's talk will be a bit technical. So um, if you have questions about the notation, please don't hesitate to ask any time. Um, and if it's sometimes a bit technical, maybe uh, bear with me. Nevertheless, um, I'll try to make it uh, comfortable. Okay, but um, all these things are very well explained in, in this original papers that I will provide you um, if you want, and it's, uh, it's easy, you can follow all the details um, at home, in the office, or in the train, or plane back. Okay. So the CMC SH gauge condition, condition, so I explained yesterday to you that if we want to evolve Einstein equations, um, if we want to evolve initial data using Einstein equations, we always have to fix a gauge. And the gauge that we uh, use today is called CMC SH gauge, and, uh, and the following will explain what that means. So we consider initial data sets M G naught K naught such that tau naught, which is the trace of K with respect K naught with respect to G naught. So this zero here is just the index of the K, and this A, B are the indices of the second fundamental form. And in general, we use tau to, to denote K, A, B, G, A, B, K, A, B. Okay, so this is the, this is the mean curvature. And we assume that this mean curvature, which in general is a function, is now constant on M. So the initial slice that we start with, the CMC is constant. Now this is somewhat of a restriction, and this is why this gauge only applies to certain initial value problems in GR. But if you have a background space-time um, that has a CMC foliation, meaning a foliation where the CMC tau is actually a time function. If you perturb it a bit, in the cases we are interested in, you can always show that a small perturbation also has a CMC surface. This is not so easy to prove, but you can prove it. So the assumption of starting with an, 
uh, with the CMC initial surface is, is fine. You're not losing out on generality in this class of space time that you're interested in. And we also assume that M is compact and we'll make some more restrictions later on. Um, so we are now interested in the maximal globally hyperbolic development of, of such initial data sets that have constant CMC. And you already learned that if you take some of the full Einstein equations that correspond somehow to the time direction, you can derive the constraints from them. So now take, let's take the spatial part of the Einstein equation, just write them down with respect to this ADM ansatz that we that I wrote down yesterday with the labs uh, function, the shift vector field in the very beginning of the lecture. So how does, so this is still, this is the Ritchie tensor of the space time metric. So now how does, and these are the, the, the spatial indices, so to say. So how does this equation look like if you express it in terms of this uh, second fundamental form, labs shift and the physical metric? Let's just write it down. So it's the partial derivative with respect to time of KAB. So this is a computation that you can just do, just evaluate this metric, uh, this, just evaluate this equation for this metric, and this is what you get. So let's take a look at this equation. Um, here, R, A, B, without, uh, without the bar, that's the, re that's the Ricci tensor of the spatial metric G. Yeah? So I can, if you want for orientation, you can write it like this. Yeah? So the way that I wrote it, we can already see, so this somehow is an evolution equation for K, A, B, okay? So if I, I mean, it's nonlinear, so I have some, um, or let's say it's sort of has terms on the right-hand side that also depend, depend on K, that's in principle fine. And if you prescribe N and the, geo, uh, and the metric G and so on and so forth, you can, you sort of, you get an evolution equation for K, yeah, naively. But it's not immediate to solve this equation, so we have to make some restrictions, yeah. Beside this evolution equation, And there's a sort of a typo that I made yesterday on the blackboard that was pointed out to me. So please uh, correct this in your notes or it will be correct in, in my notes when I post them is that I uh, forgot some brackets in the definition of the second fundamental form. So the correct way to write the time derivative of the metric should be this one. So here we have just the definition of the second fundamental form, but this is actually just an evolution equation for G. Yeah? So if I have K and if I have the, the lapse and the shift, then I know how the metric evolves. Okay? So you can derive another evolution equation for K just as if one index is, is pulled up. And let me just mention that finally. So because we'll need it. Um, and then you take, so I'm not writing it down, but let's, then you take the trace. So let's say you, take, you put up this index here, and then you can derive an evolution equation for this quantity, and you take the trace immediately of this one. So if you take the trace of k, you get tau. So you get dt of tau equal, and here you get uh, a nice Laplace operator of the labs plus n, and then you get k square plus xa nabla a tau. So that's just another, this just follows from the Einstein equations. You can, you, you plug in to get this equation, you also plug in the Hamiltonian constraint. So the straightforward computation to get this. Um, and at this equation you can already see, well, if you take tau now to be some 
well-chosen function of t, so this is just a constant on each slice, and, you, and this term that looks quite difficult to treat with if all this coupled, this term will just vanish. Um, okay, so this is 2, 2. Oh, this was 2, so that must be 2, 1. Um, CMC. So how does this gauge really look like? What do we demand from the equations? So the first condition is t equal to tau. That's the CMC condition. And the second condition, I define the following. I define a vector field on M, VA, by taking GIJ. This is the Christoffel symbol of G minus a Christoffel symbol with a, with a hat and this symbol corresponds to some once for all fixed background metric on M, okay? So this is the Christoffel symbol of what I call gamma, once for all fixed, some smooth metric on M that does not change, does not evolve. We just take it sort of as a fixed, fixed background on the spatial slices. So now it's surprising, but this, this, this thing which looks totally coordinate dependent is actually not. This is a global vector field um, on M, so it's a well-defined object even if M is not, does not have global coordinates. And what I impose for this vector field, so that's my second, so I'm doing this here, so it's two things, so I impose these two things, is that it vanishes. And that's the so-called spatial harmonic gauge. Why spatial harmonic? Because if you would put here a space time index, you would regain the harmonic gauge that you've seen in Justin Corvino's talk at the very beginning, okay? So, so far, this is just a choice and the, the main um, aim of analyzing the system, how it looks like in this choice, is actually to make this choice valid. I mean, so far it's not clear whether in this choice of gauge, the system really has uh, a well post initial value problem. So this is what you have to show. So far, uh, we choose these things for convenience, but we don't know whether it really leads to something yet. So there's the consequences. of the gauge conditions. Am I using? Um, particular index conventions over whether... Um, ah, e well, uh, so, so um, A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth are always uh, spatial indices. Oh yeah, I, I, I saw. I, saw I, should have, I should have said that. So um, Greek letters are always space time, and, and uh, regular ones are always just spatial. I'm sorry. Uh, this, this seems so normal to me, but it's good. Thank you for asking. That's correct. So it's a, so so it's actually a ti it's a time function, right? So it's not just a sort of. Of course, you have many sort of when the, when the, the constant mean curve needs to change monotonically and strictly monotonically on your space time that you want to evolve. Yeah, we need it. It's a time function here. Yeah. Okay. So what are the con what are the consequences? So if you look at the Laps equation there. Um, you can just plug in the CMC condition and what you get is a nice elliptic equation for the laps. Okay. And, and, this, and the next thing is a bit of a longer computation, so I'm not going to do it, but um, this is something you can check. If you take the time derivative of the spatial harmonic gauge condition, you will get an elliptic equation for the shift vector that looks a bit complicated. Let's write it down once.
So that's the lead derivative with respect to x, okay, of this uh, vector field. Now you tell me this vector field vanishes, that's correct. But sometimes you know in equations you add a zero because it's meaningful in some sense. So here you do the same because later you will need it. Yeah, you can, but you can put it also to zero if you just want to analyze the solution. But I keep it here because it's used often later in the proof. And I just want to point out that you need to know that it's there if you want. Okay, so this is quite of a quite of an operator here, and here's still some part that acts on the that acts on the on the shift vector. So now it turns out, and this is again something you just have to believe me at the moment, is that this operator acting on shift is a nice isomorphism of Hs plus one to Hs minus one if you have negative curvature on your manifold, yeah, negative sectional curvature on your manifold, so for now you could, for instance, just believe that this gamma there is a metric that has negative sectional curvature. If that's the case, then this operator is a nice isomorphism, which means that you can solve this equation. Okay? Okay, and another consequence is the following. So let's define this operator delta g hat, so that's not the regular Laplace operator with respect to g, but it's something like a mixed operator of g and the background metric. Okay. And then the spatial harmonic gauge condition implies that this is actually a bit simpler. So Hij is just, just some symmetric tensor field here, just to show how this operator acts. Um, so it reduces to, to this elliptic operator. Sorry? Nabla hat. So anything with hat corresponds to this metric, okay? Sorry, again? Yes, so, so this is a definition of Laplace hat G, and I define it, so it's both a bit of, it's, it's, it's a bit of gamma and it's a bit of G, and here, here, here I say what I choose. No, no, it's very important to ask this because these things are, if you really want to look at this paper in, in detail at this idea, then um, you need to, be you need to be careful with these things because they, they make a difference, yeah? Okay, and now you have something like a small miracle, which is the following. So now if you look at, uh, at the Ricci tensor of, this, of the physical metric G, this has the following expansion. So it is actually just this elliptic operator acting on Gij plus Sij that depends just on G and its first derivatives plus delta Ij. And delta Ij is again a zero that nevertheless uh, we uh, take uh, in these equations, so it's just that's how it's defined. And uh, Sij is at most quadratic in first derivatives of G. Okay. So now we can gather all these uh, all these findings. 
so far, this is just straightforward computations. There's no, no other ingredient. And now I'm getting the reduced system by just collecting all the equations that I've mentioned so far and imposing the gauge conditions. So what, what do I get? I'll just abbreviate them now because you have already seen them, but I, um, I write sort of the most important part. So the evolution for equation for Kij now reads essentially Yes. So the important thing in this evolution equation uh, is the fact that this Ricci tensor up to a small perturbation, in a sense, yeah, is just this type of generalized Laplace operator. I'm having the equation for Gij. So this we've seen already. This does not really change. I mean, that's a nice equation. We will not modify it. And then I'm having the elliptic equation And then I'm having all this, um, all this operator. Let's call maybe this operator P. So all the orange thing here is called P. I've written this carefully in my script, so just don't, don't copy it like this because it looks horrible. But just that you know what I mean. So all the orange parts, all everything that's acting on, on X, I call, I call P. Of course, P depends. If you see also on the, on the geometry. Yeah, so Px equal to something, yeah? Okay. And this system are now the reduced Einstein equations in CMC SH gauge. Now, what is the big difference if you are familiar with the harmonic gauge, the full harmonic gauge? What is the main difference between this gauge and the full harmonic gauge? First of all, let's look what they have in common. So you've been told that the Einstein equations are a wave equation in some sense, if you look at the, from an evolutionary picture. So if you, and let's maybe uh, write here still the two, to NKAB, if you set, just, just for, for fun, set N to 1, X to 0, then essentially DTGIJ is minus 2 KAB. So if you take this equality and you plug it back in here, you get the second derivative of GIJ. And then you look at this term, so at this, and at this where you replace Kij by dtgij, and you see that with the right sign, so this has a minus sign here, this has a minus sign. If you bring it on the other side, it has the exact opposite sign, so you get a wave operator. So these two evolution equations, in a sense, they contain an, a wave equation. Just that the operator now looks a bit different. I mean, so you can call it if you want. I will not use this notation later, but just just define sort of a wave operator with respect to this generalized Laplacian. You find this operator in these two equations. So that this is something these two gauges have in common. Something that they don't have in common are the two elliptic equations. Now, you're all very familiar with elliptic equations, or many of you, because you study elliptic problems on, on spatial hypersurfaces. So elliptic equations are not local equations. You have to solve them at once, right? While evolution equation, like a wave equation, you just have to solve thinking about the domain of dependence, right? So you can, in a sense, in the harmonic gauge, you can locally evolve your space time, while in this gauge, you really have to know what's going on on the full spatial slice, yeah? So when you or we solve these equations, I mean, this, th these equations make this gauge in some sense non-local. And that's a big difference to the harmonic, the full harmonic gauge. 
Okay, I'm starting a new section now. So what we will do now is we will now look at the system of which we don't know whether it actually has a solution or whether it solves Einstein equations, meaning this one here, and we will show both of these things. So a few comments about uh, proving local existence for, for such a coupled system. In principle, these proofs are all very similar. So if you will look, for instance, at the book of Hans Ringström that I um, mentioned yesterday, that I highly recommend to, to read, you will find a, a proof, a very detailed, careful proof about uh, local existence of quasi-linear wave equations. And uh, essentially, this proof also uh, has a very similar setup to what I will describe now. Um, so, if you are reading other local existence proofs of similar systems at some point, you will find um, several parallels, I would, I would guess. So, understanding the overall scheme can be helpful for the future. <laughs> okay, so... local existence. So keep in mind that we have this metric gamma with a covariant derivative uh, gamma hat that we have fixed once for all on our manifold M. And we will define all the function spaces with respect to this. Um, and these will all be Sobolev spaces. Yesterday I wrote down the definition of a Sobolev space. We'll define all these spaces with respect to this background metric that never changes. So the standard Sobolev norm of order S, denote by S, um, and we define a combined norm for the quantities G and K. So these are the evolutionary quantities, and N and uh, X are the elliptic quantities. I will refer to them like this. So we'll use kind of a nice H to define the SH norm of G and the S minus one norm of K. And now if we, uh, so and the, and the corresponding space is of course, is of course HS. Um, now, when we evolve the metric G by the system, we always want to compare it to the background metric um, gamma, which is fixed. So to compare them, we define um, the following. Call it ellipticity constant. Um, so let gamma of G bigger than one be such that gamma minus one g of y y smaller or equal uh, of g and uh, smaller or equal to gamma I'm sorry I mixed the next term lambda minus one g uh, y y is smaller or equal to gamma yy smaller or equal to lambda g yy for all y in the tangent bundle of m. So it means these, this lambda describes in what sense gamma and g are equivalent. And then we define uh, a more general constant which includes the lapse and shift vector, their pointwise norms. So lambda of the space time metric now includes the laps and the shift and g by being lambda of g plus the L infinity norm of n plus 
the L infinity norm of n to the minus 1 plus the L infinity norm of x. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? We don't know. I'm not saying they exist. I just defined them. So for initial data, they will exist. Like I'm just choosing initial data for some finite g, like some regular finite g, they will exist. And when my quantities evolve, of course, I need to control g in Sobolev norms. And that will tell me that this constant exists. And then I also control n and x by the elliptic estimates. And they will show that this is finite. But you're completely right that in general, for a general solution, I don't know if this object may go to infinity in finite time. That's, that's completely true. It may be. It may be. Yeah. And gamma of t is the supremum over a time interval, 0 t, um, t star, t star in, no, t in t star. Um, gamma g of t, OK. So this is just notations, and uh, it's completely right. We need these things to be finite to work with our equations and to know that the operators are well defined and so on and so forth. Initially, this is true. In the evolution, we need to control it. So what does local existence mean? Or you can also say local well posedness if you want. Um, so the system. reduced Einstein equations that we had on the previous board um, is locally well posed, and I mean locally in time, if and only if the following things hold. For a given initial data, ID, initial data, G naught, K naught in HS, S sufficiently large. So let's say, as I said yesterday, let's say S bigger than 3 over 2 plus 1, yeah, for instance. That would be fine for us. There exists. A unique solution G, K, N, and X in, and let's say C naught, zero T to the space hs cross hs plus 1 cross hs plus 1, and probably of better regularity. I'm not writing this down. There are many notions of regularity. You can make it, let's say you want to have maybe one, like you want to intersect this with the c1, and then you want to here reduce this to the hs minus 1, and so on and so forth. So you want to have a unique solution that, of course, coincides, coinciding with the initial data id at t equals 0. And this whole thing is for t, let's say this is t star, for t star strictly bigger than, than 0. Yeah, you want to have a short time interval. Excuse me. Yes? Yes, uh, if it would be important, I would write bigger. Let, let's, let's forget the second. You don't, we will not need it to understand the rest of the talk. Okay? And I have it fully written out in more generality in the notes that I put online tomorrow. I want, this is very technical. I want to focus on that. But thanks a lot for asking. If you want, I can explain it to you after the talk in detail. But I'll try to keep it, keep it short at the moment. Excuse me for this. So that just means that the Sobolev norms at each, on each slice of this short time foliation, the Sobolev norms 
behave continuously. Yeah, the Sobolev norm of each of these quantum behaves changes continuously if I move forward in time. And what I, what I suppressed now is that, of course, this behavior can also be differentiable. So lower regularity Sobolev norms uh, behave differentiable in time. And if you go lower, lower in the spatial regularity, you increase in the time regularity. That's what you can do. But that's completely not important for the moment. Yeah, so we have this, so such a solution exists. That's the, that's the most important thing first, because you, you want to work with it, so you need to know that it exists um, and that it's unique. The second point, so-called Cauchy stability, and that says that I'm just writing. If I take the initial data and I map it to its solution, in C naught, and then I'm just copying what I had here before. This map is continuous. What does that mean? That means if I change the initial data by an epsilon in their respective Sobolev norms, so will the, so will the solution. Yeah. So if I take a sequence of initial data that converges to my initial data of the background, the solutions will converge in a similar sense. And third, the so-called continuation criterion and that says the following which is related to the question of the nice person up there in the pink shirt and that says the following the maximal time of existence call T star is either infinity or the Lima superior as T approaches this maximal time of existence of the quantity lambda of G plus the first derivatives of g bar in L infinity plus k in L infinity goes to zero, it uh, goes to infinity, sorry, yes, it's infinity, exactly. So, This is the way that local existence usually is formulated, and I will explain in a second why. The function spaces that are used for doing this, they can vary between the problems. But this is usually, this encaptures what you want from a good local existence theory for a system. And let's, let's think a second why. First of all, the fact that a solution exists assures you that you can work in this gauge. If there would be no solution, it would make no sense. The Cauchy stability tells you that if you want your solution to exist for a long, long time, like the background does, hopefully, then you need just to make the perturbation initially very small. Because the smaller you make the perturbation initially, the more the global, the solution coincides with the solution, with the background solution, so it will exist longer. Yeah? but you don't know if it exists till infinity, and that's the precise question of stability. But you can sort of make it existence for arbitrarily large time, but finite. And the continuation criterion is, is very important because if you work on your solution and you want to prove something about the solution, you would, first thing you want to prove is global existence. And with this criterion, you see, okay, the only thing that I need to show for global existence, because here you just know that it exists for some small t, but you want the small t to be infinity. Actually, you want to have 
this t to be infinity, you just need to show that these quantities do not blow up. If you control these quantities, you know your foliation exists for all time. Okay, this is why you need it. Um, and such a theorem has been proven by Lars Anderson and Vince Moncrief, I think in 03. So the reduced Einstein equations, uh, meaning the CMC SH reduced Einstein equations, are locally well posed And the solution solves the vacuum Einstein equations. Okay, so the proof of this is very technical, but it has some universal ideas. And I would like you to, uh, to see these ideas, some of them at least. Um, let's again start with some terminology. So first, um, what I will in a sense do is I will suppress a bit the elliptic system, because the elliptic system, we know very well that it's solvable. We, this can be shown at each step of uh, solving this problem. So we'll mainly focus on the, um, on the evolution equations, which I will abbreviate by LU acting on U equal to F on U, where U is essentially G minus 2K, or small u, small v. Yeah? This is just a notation. Now. What is LU, L, or L depending on U, so L depends also on the solution, that is essentially depending on N, G, and X, and they depend on, on U, yeah? They depend on U by the elliptic equations, X and N. And this operator is a matrix Yeah, so this is a two by two matrix, and this is my operator. So you see that this essentially is the principal part of this evolutionary uh, system. Everything else, the right-hand side, I put in F. Yeah, so F is the right-hand side. You can make this translation what exactly F is. It's the right-hand side of the evolutionary system. And as I said, n g x of u is solving or means solving the elliptic system for a given u, which is g minus 2k. So if I prescribe g and minus 2k, I can solve the system. I'm getting n and x. And of course, I'm getting also g. That's trivial. Uh, g I've already given. Now, I can also write this like sigma of gk um, is nx. So that's the solution mapping.
of the elliptic system The elliptic system I will not repeat, but let's mention a few facts that you can check about these operators. So here's a lemma. <laughs> Let our background metric gamma be of negative sectional curvature. And tau not equal to 0 and we have our gauge v equal to 0, then this big operator p that defines the shift is an operator from s plus 1 to h s minus 1. It's an isomorphism. This essentially relies on integration by parts in a, trivial, in a, in a clever way. And B, which is the lapse operator, also from Hs plus 1 to Hs minus 1, is an isomorphism. That means whatever G and K I put in the right-hand side of the elliptic equations, I get a solution. So I don't have to worry so much about solving this. Nevertheless, this is not fully trivial to prove that, but we have to assume it for the moment. And moreover, I have an estimate if I compare solutions to different, to different data. So let's say the norm of sigma G1, K1 minus, the norm, minus um, sigma G2, K2. So this would just be different, uh, different sets of data in H S plus 1 is smaller or equal to a constant that just depends on r, I will say what r is in a second, times gk1 minus g2k2 in, and this is in hs, that's very important, yeah. So I can always compare or measure a, a difference between n1, uh, n1 and x1 and nk and n2 and x2, yeah, by the difference of these pre-images under these elliptic operators or under the solution map, yeah? So if I make the perturbation in gk small, n and x are close together. That's very important. Okay. And r, yes, I didn't say that. So here r, r is the radius of a ball, b s r, around some initial data, u0 if you want, where, so this is the ball in the Sobolev space, in the corresponding Sobolev space, where g and k, g1, k1, g2, k2 are in. Yeah? So if you close to the initial data, you understand how, these, how everything, how the, the regular, regularity is fine, these norms are finite, everything is good. Then, so if g1, k1, and g2, k2 are in fact in this ball, then this, estimate holds. Okay. These are all things you, you have to check, but for the moment what I want to tell you is that the elliptic system is nice enough not to worry about it in this setting. But certainly we have to worry about the evolution system and we have to control what happens. Now, if you want to prove existence of something, that's quite difficult. You cannot just go solution. You have to like do it mildly and get closer to your solution. So you have to, in principle, get a foot in the door. And how this is done is by constructing an approximate sequence of solutions. And why can we not just solve the system immediately? or why did Anderson Moncrief have to, had to prove this theorem before using this gauge, is because this system was not part of some known class of PDEs that people had analyzed before. However, the individual equations, if you think about these elliptic equations and the evolution equations in some sense, 
Those type of equations are understood if you prescribe the right-hand side. But if the right-hand side and the operator itself depend on the solution, it becomes difficult. So the question is how do you reduce a nonlinear system to solving just linear systems, in a sense? Okay, so the first step to make it easy is we, there's a, whenever you construct a function space, usually at some point there is a lemma that says that the smooth functions are dense in this function space. And the reason why doing it is that you want to approximate any object in this function space by smooth solutions, because you like to work with smooth solutions. That's true also for our function space. So let's do the following. We have our initial data u. That's the total initial data given by our problem. k naught, g naught. Now, let u not m be, so m zero infinity, be in the set of smooth functions, uh, taking the section with the ball of radius r in the Sobolev space around this initial data. So you have your initial data, and now you take all the set that it's a radius r with respect to the Sobolev norm around this initial data in the space, and this r is just some fixed constant that if you want, you can make it a bit smaller later. Yeah? For now, it's just a constant. So you take a sequence, uh, um, that converges in hs to u0. Yeah? So you take a sequence that, co that, go that converges to your initial data uh, on the first slice. And now you want to construct you want to construct a sequence um Of course, these objects are defined on some m cross a small time interval. And at the end of the day, you want this sequence to converge to a solution of your system. That's the aim. So how do you set this up? Well, you start, and that's how you get your foot in the door. So you define u not this u not here, I mean downstairs, so the first object in here depending on t simply by continuing the first element in this approximation constant in time. So you just go close to your initial data, and whatever you have there, you just uh, continue it in time, being constant. That's not a solution, of course. And you define f naught, so the first, the first right-hand side of your system, so to say, by zero. And the first operator, L0, by L of U0. And now you do a nice induction. First, you solve, so for M bigger than zero, you solve NM XM by being the image of the solution map of the elliptic system of um, lm is l of um, and the right-hand side, fm, is the right-hand side of, I mean, evaluated at um. And now, how do you, find m, how do you define m plus one? Define um plus one by the solution to the linear hyperbolic system
lm um plus one fm and the initial data at t zero or at, at, at zero yeah, is the m plus one's element in the approximating sequence because that is smooth. Now, you can look in several books on nonlinear or evolution equations that you can find that such a system is solvable. So, let's agree, I have two minutes. Uh, let's agree I wipe the blackboard and then you give me two more minutes and then we stop. But it's a free country, whoever wants to leave before that. Okay, so now we have constructed the solution, uh, we have to cons constructed uh, a sequence, and by some miracle, the sequence in fact converges to a solution of our original system. And the question is, how do we show this? And there are essentially two steps in the proof. One I will just start to explain now, the other one tomorrow, or later today, depending on how this uh, issue with the lecture swap will be arranged. Is the following. So the first step in the proof solution of the reduced Einstein equations is the following. Okay. So we define an energy, and an energy is essentially just a somewhat geometric, sophisticated Sobolev norm by the following integral over m of the u m plus one, so it's the small, uh, that's a small u, so that's the first component. Um, up, u m plus one gm. So here we define uh, an integral, and sort of L2 integral, for measuring u m plus one um plus one, um plus one, vm plus one, this is the big um plus one, but we define it in terms of the previous gm, gm, gm metric, so the metric of the previous step, yeah? So we measure the solution of the new step by something of the previous step. And since we locally control in this in doing the sequence, we can locally control our norms, we know that these are equivalent. So we can say ES define now independent of this previous step by UM plus one in L infinity on this interval for some small time T star in HS. We can say these norms, these two norms are equivalent as long as these constants are bounded, and we define another notion, and then I write down the last lemma, and then we stop. Just some notation. So rho m is y minus one half dt gm minus the lead derivative with respect to xm of gm, so it all depends on the previous step. And now we can prove the following, which is really the, the center of all analysis of evolution equations in some sense. No, don't write numbers here. And this is a so-called energy estimate. 
So we know that our, our solution, U, our, our element in the sequence, UM plus one, solves the system. So we assume it solves the system. And when it solves the system, we have the following. If S is bigger than 3 over 2 plus 1, then ES of T UM plus 1, smaller or equal a constant C, the exponential of, again, this constant, integral 0 to T, rho M, H S minus 1, plus G bar M, which is the total, all the quantities of the step M in H S, DT, bracket closed, times E S of the, at time 0, so the initial data, plus The right-hand side of the equations, Fm, in L1 on 0t star, I'm mixing t and t star, this should be, uh, this should be an s, and these quantities depend on s. There's too many t's here. Um, Hs. Okay. So what does it mean, for a second? The energy of this solution, which is sort of the higher, higher equivalent, higher uh, regularity equivalent of those, those is the, the first order, so to say, is bounded by an integral over these quantities that all come from the previous iteration step by its initial data and by an L1 integral over the right-hand side. That means, if these things here are bounded in the previous step, let's assume that for a second, this is just some constant, this is just the initial data, we know that approximates our initial data of the actual problem, so we know very well what that is, so we can say it is small in some sense, and here we have an L1 norm over the, integral, uh, over the interval 0 t star. Now, if I make t star very small, this integral will become very small. So if I use the fact that I only want to prove short time existence, I can make this small. This I can manipulate by using initial data. And this just comes from the previous iteration step. So I will prove, starting next time, just to say, how do you derive such an estimate? It's just by taking the system and integrating by parts. That's it. But I nevertheless show you how it goes. And then how to make from this, how to, how to use this estimate to show that, in fact, the sequence of solutions is first bounded, and then use the estimate again for a difference of solutions to show that the sequence actually converges. All these steps will be shown by these energy estimates, and they all come just from one fact, that we have an evolutionary system, and these are the natural estimates for the system. And why this is the case, we'll see next time. Thanks.